Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. Thought I would give you a break from our continuing study on the book of Acts and share with you a sermon that I preached some years back. We will get back into our study on Acts in our next lesson. The sermon is called Confronting the Culture, and I hope it stirs your soul, challenges your mind, and that the Lord will give you the grace to live it out. So enjoy. I want to look at confronting the culture. How are we supposed to respond in this world that is becoming more and more day by day like Sodom and Gomorrah? And so I want to look at Elijah and a story that you're familiar with, Elijah confronting the prophets of Baal. But I hope I bring something out here that's a little bit different. And so we'll be in, uh, in 1 Kings, but I just want to begin in James, book of James, because James ends up speaking about Elijah for a moment. In James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, he says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So what he's doing, he's saying, okay, this is what we should do. We should confess our sins to each other and pray for each other because a righteous man or righteous woman, their prayers are powerful. Then to give definition to it, to give an example to it, he says, Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly. Now, the thing we need to look at here is Elijah was a man just like us. Now, he wasn't a special man. Neither was Moses. Neither was Elijah. Neither was John the Baptist, I mean, these were all men. Now, of course, they had their calling, and, but they were all men that ended up saying yes to God. And so the things that went on in these men, all these great men and women of God in Scripture, was not the aspect that they were great men and women of God themselves, but that they were willing to believe a God that is great and strong like the song we sung. So Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced his crops. Now, the thing we have to look at is he is just like us. He is human. That's what this man was. He was a human being. So he's just like us. In one sense, he's not like us. Because this man had a passion, he had a fire, he had a commitment, he had a zeal, he counted the cost, he was willing to lay his life down, and in that sense, we're not like him. Not that we can't become like him, it's that the majority of the church is not like him because they don't want to count the cost, they don't want to pay the price, they want a comfortable Christianity, they want to live in a world that is just, yes, it's going crazy, but they want to have their own little bubble that they live in and have this nice little life instead of becoming people that are learning how to rightly, according to the Word of God and the Spirit of God, confront a culture that's at war with him, that's in desperate need of salvation. The hope is that we can always change. That's the hope. We don't have to stay what we are. We don't have to stay in this lackadaisical kind of lukewarm Christianity that just wants us to get by. Now, an interesting little side point here is that Elijah, the name means God is Jehovah. And so I was thinking about this last night and this morning in prayer. I'm going, every time Ahab went and spoke the name Elijah, he's actually saying God is Jehovah, not Baal, not all the other gods. He's being forced to say God is Jehovah. Wow, that was really neat. What a, how smart that was of God to inspire the parents to call him Elijah so that now it's constantly coming before the people, God is Jehovah, God is Jehovah. You know, what a great idea. <laughs> Well, let's begin to look at the story. I want to lay the story out before I start getting into where I really want to go with this. And so the outline of the historical account is Elijah comes on the scene out of nowhere. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, either you're insane or you got the goods. And this is a serious test. For him, he had to walk in faith. He had to obey because God spoke to him. This wasn't something made up in his own mind that he was going to go do this. I think I'll go and tell Ahab it's not going to rain. It was a God-ordained, God-inspired, God-empowered 
command and something he had to act upon. He had to obey for this to come about. And so here you have Elijah that I believe, okay, I don't think he'd have access more than likely to King Ahab unless he was already known. So quite possibly he was already a prophet, prophesying, known to a certain degree, but this is the beginning of him becoming a national prophet. Now he was the voice speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel. And so Elijah prayed a dangerous prayer. Now you're going to want to pray a prayer like that? Because when Elijah prayed that prayer, when he said to Ahab, it's not going to rain except at my command, that meant that Elijah was going to suffer with the rest of the people. And so we are not willing to pray dangerous prayers because we don't want to suffer. So we pray safe prayers. And so we can even go to, to loved ones that aren't saved and say, oh, God, save them, rescue them. But we want this to be nice. We want it to be a happy way it happens. We don't want them acting out. We don't want them to have the demon possession they may have manifesting itself in ways we don't want it to. Make it nice and easy so, well, we're just all nice and happy now. But we many times don't get what we really need because we're not willing to pray dangerous prayers. We want safe prayers. We want happy prayers. We want answers that's going to give us everything we want. We don't want to pray something that's going to shake our life and shake people around us. And so I think we get what we don't pray for. In essence, we get deadness as a result of it. We don't have the life, the power, because we want safe little prayers, a comfortable little life, and we believe the lie that life is all about happiness. So guess what? We live a life for happiness. Design everything around that. Elijah was willing to pray a dangerous prayer and willing to suffer. Willing to suffer. Now, the authority that God gave this man, I think, is very important because he had authority so that at his word, you understand, God went and gave the man authority, just like the Lord did when he walked this planet and he had disciples and he sent 70 disciples out and sent the 12 out. He says, I'm giving you authority. And then after he rose again from the dead, he says, I'm giving you authority. So God gives authority. But when he gives authority, our responsibility is to use that authority and use it the way that he wills it according to his word. And so God was giving this man authority. And that's some serious authority that when I speak, it's not going to rain and it will not rain until I speak again. Now, you want to know why God won't give that kind of authority to many people? Because just imagine if Elijah was like so many average Christians today. Okay, at your word, it's not going to rain. So you go and you speak the word to Ahab, and, and then you're back out in the world, and 20 years later, it's still no rain. Can't trust you with the power, because you'd abuse it one way or the other. If it got a little hard for you, the river's drying up, and you don't have any water, so you'd call the rain down because you'd want comfort and not in the place of obedience to hear the voice of God. And so until God can trust his people, he will not entrust his people with the power of God. So that means it's either going to pass us by or he has to do some serious growing up, and sometimes that growing up can be very painful. In 1 Kings chapter 18, in verse 1, it says, After a long time, in the third year, the word of God came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. Now, there's so much in here that is in the story that we have to understand that is not even being spoken, but it's what we can understand from it. Elijah was in the place of fellowship with God to hear and to obey and to, to go to Ahab. Three and a half years later now, he is in relationship with God. He's man of prayer. It's a crazy thing, but I do this a lot, where I'll be in a, in a place, a church or whatever, and I'll do it to a pastor or somebody in leadership or whatever, and I'll just tell me about your prayer life. 99.99% .99 of the time, they, they are heen and hawing and go, well, uh, um, well, it's not what it should be. And this is, why isn't it? Why isn't it? And so how do you think God's ever going to use you if you can't even pray, if you can't even have a prayer life, if you can't even be faithful in the Word of God, and you haven't even come to the place of some of the basics of what the faith is, how are you going to shake a world? Because until we become a people that are passionate after our God, passionate in relationship with Him, that it defines our life, it defines how we live, it defines our time, it defines who we hang with and who we fellowship with, what we do with everything, 
Until that really defines their life, the power is withheld from us. The glory is withheld. He's not going to give it to people that will abuse it because he's looking for faithful people. And so after a long time, three and a half years, he heard. The voice came. I imagine it was probably a whisper. It's time, son. It's time. And because God had given him that kind of authority, and because he knew that Elijah was in the place of obedience, there is nothing noble about rebellion. There's nothing noble about disobedience. What is God wanting from his children? Obedience. So he wanted a man that he could go and say, go tell Ahab. Well, that's a scary thing. You go before the king, and those kings, they had the power to have you immediately executed. So he obeys, okay, life or death, I'm going to go in there. And then three and a half years later, he hears from God, says, go in again. Speak to the man. Speak to the man. Now, for three and a half years, Elijah has been hunted down. Well, maybe not quite three and a half years, maybe three years or maybe two and a half years. Because, you know, in the beginning, Elijah just must have laughed the guy off. Yeah, sure, you got the power to stop it from raining. Yeah, right. Well, a couple months later, he's scratching his head now, and he's wondering. Six months later, you know, he's kind of being convinced. A year later, he says, okay, fine, this guy. We're in trouble. Our nation's prosperity is hurting. You see, it took the prosperity of the nation to be affected before the king started really paying attention. And then he was getting very angry because nobody could find him because God was hiding this man according to the situation and, you know, I thought about this. I was thinking about this today while I was in prayer. I can't tell you how many times I've whined and complained. I'm ashamed of it. At times where I'm not out there preaching like I want. And I'm going, three and a half years, this man did not preach a sermon. He did not do another miracle. God fed him with ravens and gave him water from a river. And when the river dried up because of the drought, well, he sent him to a, a widow to take care of him. Why do we have such a hard time with obedience? Why are we so rebellious on the inside when we know what we should do, and then we tell people, yes, I know I should be doing it, but you're still not doing it? Why is the thing repeated again and again and again and again and again? Why don't you just start obeying? I'll tell you what, your life would be a lot better. <laughs> it really would. You'd have a lot more joy in your life. Because by saying no and stubbornness and all the junk that's there, you suffer a lot more than God ever wants you to. Dropping down to verse 18. So now it's time. Elijah's showing himself. Ahab sees Elijah. And this is what King Ahab did. It says, when King Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? How I wish that we would have that reputation. That's what they said to Paul, right? He who has turned the world upside down has come here too. How we need to have that type of reputation than the tame church that we have today in America. It used to be at one time the early Pentecostal church was on the other side of the tracks. They were the poor. They were the rejected. They were the people that, that were looked down upon. But they had power for signs and wonders, and they saw multitudes saved. Now we're on the other side of the track, and we don't have power. We're not seeing it happen anymore because we become acceptable, because we don't want to face the shame of what it can be to be a people operating in the power of God. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? We'll come back to that a little later. Ahab could not look in the mirror and see that he was the troubler. He saw the man of God as a troubler, but that's always what it's going to be, isn't it? It's always going to be. The, the world, when men and women of God start rising up and the anointing starts resting upon them, they are going to be looked at as the troublemakers. They're going to be looked at as the ones that are causing all the issues that's going on. Just get them out of the way and everything would be great. And really, you get them out of the way and you are given over to apostasy because they become a voice that's holding back the insanity. And so in verse 19 then, I think this is so interesting. Let me read the verse first. But now summon, Elijah is speaking, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Azra who eat at Jezebel's table. And what it means that those 400 prophets of Azra 
eat at Jezebel's table only means that she provided food for them, not that they had a big, huge table and they all sat at. Look at this situation, though. He comes up to Ahab. It's time for the rain to fall, the miracle to happen. And instead of coming into the presence of the king and acting like a subject normally would, Elijah takes control of it. You understand here? He is the boss here now, not Ahab. Ahab is the one shaking his head saying yes to the prophet because the man of God is the one that has the real authority. We think that the government is the one that has the authority, but here the government, in essence, is cowering before the man of God. Here's what's going to go on. Summon the people, and we're going to meet. You bring all these prophets, and we'll meet, and we'll see who's God. And what does Ahab do? He obeys. He does it because this man of God that was proven now is stalking, right? Three and a half years. The evidence of it is there now. This man has the power. And so now the world is paying attention. The early church shook the known world. Why? Because of the day of Pentecost. When you look at the, at the facts, the actual facts of the modern Pentecostal movement, there has never been a more evangelistic, more effective movement in the world's history. That's a fact. It's not made up. It's the reality of it. Why do you think the devil wants to silence Pentecost so much? Because it shook the world 2,000 years ago, and it shook the world when it broke out in 1906, and he wants to silence that because a church with power accomplishes something. A church without power accomplishes nothing. And that's really what it comes down to be. God wants a church that is alive, and full of the Holy Ghost with the power flowing through it to touch a hurting, dying world because it's the only way they're going to begin to really listen. Now, it happens. Here is this event. You have Elijah. You have the king of Israel and all of his elite soldiers. You then have all of these prophets that are there. Now, Jezebel didn't send her 400 prophets of Azra, but the 450 prophets of Baal were there. And then you had all these people of Israel that were watching. So this was a confrontation. Just look at how lopsided it is. You know, one person against how many thousands? They had the thousands, but Elijah had the God. Uh, it was really one-sided in the opposite way, <laughs> totally, completely. And they didn't understand that. But now here they are. Verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Now, there's something we have to understand here. The world is watching. They want an answer to the pain and the problems of life. Not all of them, but there are those who are watching, and they're saying, does the church have the answer? And then they look at this issue and that issue, and they see the, the compromise and the worldliness and, and all the junk in there, and they say, why do I want that? They're looking. They are looking. They're saying, is there anything that can deal with my pain? Is there anything that can deal with my problems? Is there anything that can bring change to my life? I'm sick of the way I'm going. And they're saying, is there an answer out there? And Elijah stood up and says, okay, it's time to look. And if he would have put it like this, and he couldn't have because it would have been an expression of pride, but he could have went and says, you want to know if there's a man of God, then you show up and I'm going to show you a man of God. I'm going to show you what a man of God is. I'm going to show you what a man of God does. I'm going to show you how this works. Because really that's what was going on. God was going to use this man to confront a nation, to confront the culture. And you know what, church? We're cowering in a corner instead of confronting a culture. We're afraid because political correctness is cowering us in corners, afraid to speak against the evils of homosexuality and of adultery and fornication and all the sins that are out there and all the names. And the name is, is secondary to the reality that the church is afraid to do anything about it. I was speaking at a church in one of the New England states. Can't remember what state off the top of my head. I, I don't have no idea what I preached, but there was a woman that had been visiting that day and she was in a program learning how to be a youth pastor. So it was kind of like a live training kind of youth pastor situation. 
And so she happened to be there just visiting. And when I was done preaching, this woman was so angry at me, just enraged at me because I dealt with the sin of fornication. You want to know why she was angry? Either she was in fornication or she had friends that were. And I shouldn't have been the first one to tell her. She was supposedly going to be a youth pastor and didn't even understand that fornication, which is premarital sex of any way, shape, or form, keeps people out of the kingdom of God. You cannot be a Christian and be in fornication, adultery, any of the sexual sins. You can't. It's impossible. To withhold that from people is to not love them because truth warns. Now, of course, we're to tell them lovingly. We're to have true compassion and not go up them with, with a Bible and start beating on them, but we need to tell them the truth, that there's a God that loves them and is wanting to rescue them from their self-destructive ways that's going to take them right down to the very pits of hell. And then you have in verses 38 and 39, it says, When the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Do you understand what went on there? Elijah didn't stand up and give a theological discourse on the Trinity. What brought the people to begin to say, We have heard the truths of God. We know the Mosaic law. What brought them to the point to finally say, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. It was that the fire fell, the power of God fell, and it was so supernatural. It's not just that fire fell, but it went and consumed everything. It licked up everything so that there was no way that the prophets of Baal could say, this is just some shenanigan he's putting on. This was a God thing, 100%. Tame Christianity will never disturb a perishing world. And if the world can walk past us and ignore us, we have the, the most horrifying insult that could ever be given to us. That they can ignore us is an insult. It is a statement that we have no power, that we have nothing to offer them, that we're not disturbing them. Because if we are doing our job, we're going to do one or two things. They're going to be running to us, hugging us, saying, we love you. Or we're going to say, we want to crucify you. We want to kill you and tar and feather you. If we leave them in a place where they're saying, oh, well, yeah, do your own thing, I don't care, then we don't have any devils very angry at us. We have this disturbing statement that Paul said, and I'll tell you what, I'm scared of it. But he gave us a promise, a promise of God. And if any of you have this promise on your refrigerator, I want to talk to you afterwards, okay? Good promise. But all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are you claiming it? And so if we're not being persecuted, why aren't we being persecuted? What are we doing wrong? I'm not saying we go out and be obnoxious and weird and force something, but we should be people so full of the Holy Ghost, learning how to start to operate in the power of God, that guess what? When God starts to show up, devils start getting angry. And that's really what it should be, that we are so full of the Spirit of God that it's disturbing hell. We need God's power that can confront the culture through signs and wonders, and his manifest presence. i got to dig this book out. It's somewhere in storage. New Testament Fire in the Philippines. I've read hundreds of books on revival. This was just a, a phenomenal book. The revival took place in the 1960s. There was the Baptist denomination. He didn't give the name of it. The author of the book didn't give the name of it. I believe it was Southern Baptist. They were seeing the explosion, this revival sweeping through the Philippines. And so the denomination went and took one of their missionaries and says, we want you to go in there and investigate this and tell us why this is happening and what this is all about. So here's a Baptist man, a Baptist minister, going in trying to understand why revival is taking place. And guess what? The revival was 100% Pentecostal. So because of this and because of the size of it, the minister decided to go and look at the smallest Pentecostal denomination in the Philippines, and that was the Four Square. And so they went and started looking at the Four Square Church, started looking at the missionaries. And here's this guy investigating. I mean, he is being an investigative reporter, trying to understand what's going on here. First, he goes and he gets all the statistics from the 
denomination and starts saying, okay, what's going on here? Then he started going to the missionaries and the pastors and says, you said you had this many people saved in your church. And then the, the minister would say, well, you know, that's not true. And the guy would say, gotcha, you're lying. These numbers are all fake. He says, well, that's just the mother church, but we have 12 other churches out there and all combined. Well, we probably have about 10 times as many, but we just put this in to be conservative. He'd go into a village where, you know, the village was said to be totally converted. And he'd go there and he, he would check on a healing to verify it. Now, this is a man that does not believe in healing, that does not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, does not believe in signs and wonders. His entire life is being turned upside down because the evidence is glaring in front of him. And so what happens? He goes and checks out the reality of the healing, and the healing was real. And so you had some lay people go into the village, pray for a person that was sick or dying or whatever it was. That person is healed, and everybody in the village gets saved as a result. And when you read the book, the man is almost like apologetic, but he is at least being honest enough to say, this is what the facts bear, and it's like really hurting me, you know, because it's against everything I believed, tearing all I believed into, into pieces. And he came to the end of the book, and he says, here's the fact. For every one Pentecostal missionary, it takes at least 36 Baptist missionaries to accomplish the same thing. Tell me that we don't need Pentecost. Tell me that we don't need to understand what it's all about and begin to operate in that. Tell me that a Christianity without the power of God can do what the book of Acts did, what Paul did. We're, we're in the backwards motion going away from the power instead of going into it. Now, I know what happens. You get a bunch of weird stuff. And because people get weird, what a ploy of the devil. What smart devils there are that get the source of power so distorted that people are like, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, what they're doing is they're rejecting the real thing because they see imposters. They see perversions and distortions rather than saying, God, here's what your word says. This is what has helped me to live this out. Help it to be the reality that defines my life. Now, let's look at the reality of the confrontation. You see, this confrontation is so serious, somebody's going to die. This isn't playing church. Somebody is going to die. Either Elijah's going to die or the prophets of Baal are going to die. Both are in a battle. The prophets of Baal need to call down fire, and if they don't call down fire, they're dead. If Elijah doesn't call down fire, he's dead. And so this is serious stuff. But do we understand we're at the same identical thing right now? In our culture, the church is dying. It is dying because we aren't operating in the power of God. We have forsaken the power for a tame Christianity, a seeker-sensitive kind of movement just to make a comfortable Christian, to supposedly accommodate the world. But the world does not respond to that. They respond to the, the great prophet that calls down fire. That's what they respond to. That's when they say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Not to tame Christianity. And so until we got the power, they're not going to pay attention to it. Now, the prophets of Baal could win in one of two ways. So here's how it went. If you don't know this story, let me explain it real quickly. Elijah goes and he lays out the terms of this conflict. Okay, we got two bullocks here. You pick one, I'll take the other. Each of us will build an altar, you sacrifice your animal, and I'll sacrifice mine. Whosoever God is real will come and consume that offering. Okay, real simple. You can't make it any easier than that. And then he even goes and says, I'll let you guys go first. You do the sacrifice, you call down fire. If it is, everything's over. We don't have to go one moment longer because now you have called your God to consume the sacrifice. You see, if the prophets of Baal could call down fire, they, they would win, right? Conflict over. But how does this play out today? You see, if the world has authentic power, it wins. And it's always trying to say that it has authentic power. Whether it's in psychology, trying to say I have answers for your problems, whether it's, you know, all these different ways we try to, the world tries to manipulate people, say we have the answer, whether it's through sin and the, the chaos and the insanity of our world, and they try and say, here's the remedy, here's the happiness, you just need more drugs, you need more alcohol, you need this, you need that, all these different things. Whether it's one of those things or not, they are trying to say that they have the remedy, but what happens when you go into it? Absolute despair. 
That's all it can give. It's all the world can offer. It gives you these little expressions of supposed happiness and then takes everything from you and gives in place of what you thought you get pain and misery and sorrow than ultimately hell. You see, the world doesn't have an answer. It doesn't have the power. And so if the world had the power to offer a spiritual experience that fulfills, then it would win. Well, there's demonic power out there. And anybody who says there isn't demonic power out there doesn't understand the reality that there are devils and what devils do. There are religions out there that offer spiritual experience, but because they're demonic, they only take and cannot give. They destroy rather than give life. And so it doesn't have the ability to fulfill. It can't. And if the world had the ability to really meet the needs of people, then they certainly wouldn't consider Christianity. If a six-pack of beer could really meet the needs, then what, what do you need church for? Just get a six-pack. But you get a six-pack, you get another six-pack, another six-pack. And before you know it, you're so addicted to it that you can't even think right, and your whole life is a mess as a result of it because you started giving yourself over to evil. It's just the way that it works. What begins as seeming pleasure ends in pain and misery. It's all the world can give. So we know that the world can't satisfy the needs of people. So they can't, in essence, call fire down in that way. But there's another way that the world can win. There's another way the prophets of Baal can win. I want you to really hear this because this is where I'm really trying to go right now. The second way the prophets of Baal could win is if Elijah did not have the power and could not call down fire. Do you understand what I just said there? That's more serious than you and I understand. The first way they win if they had the goods. Well, they didn't have the goods. But if Elijah doesn't have the goods, well, then they still win. They still had the minds of the people. They still had the people trapped in their sin. They still had the people going in the direction that Israel, the northern kingdom, was going in their adultery and all their sexual sins and all the perversions. Still had them. All that was necessary was for Elijah to have no power. And by the sheer act that the church does not operate in the power of God like we should, the world wins. We don't understand the cost, you know. I mean, our compromise, our lack of prayer, our lack of passion, our lack of pursuit of God, our lack of willingness to go out and touch a perishing world, our desire to build our comfortable little safe little life, and the cost of it is more than we can imagine because we're losing the world. We're not gaining the world. We're not seeing them one to Christ. Elijah can only win if he has the power of God. The church can only win when she has the power of God. I want to look at three points of preparing to see the fire of God fall. This is out of this story that we can look at here. The very first thing after the prophets of Baal failed, I mean, they cut themselves and all the rituals, demonic rituals that they did, and you know, God just had to go and say, none of you devils are getting anywhere, so there's no fire falling, right? So nothing happened. And so it came time for Elijah, but Elijah just couldn't go up there and says, let the fire fall. He had to do something because God responds to when we properly approach him. All right, there's a right way to approach God and a wrong way to approach God. You can't approach God any way you want. You think you can approach him any way you want, then you do not know the God of the word. And so Elijah had to do some things. And the first thing he did is he went and took 12 stones and built an altar, uncut stones. He took these uncut stones and built an altar. You and I don't understand the significance, but the significance was humongous. God was pleased with the life of David for the most part. That's why he was given the testimony of a man after God's own heart. Of course, we know the stories, the accounts of where he had sinned, but the man was quick to repent when he came to the knowledge of his sin. His son, Solomon, came to power, and God blessed this man like no other man's been blessed with wisdom and wealth and, and that. Too. But what happened is Solomon took the wisdom that he had, and you can find this in Ecclesiastes, where it says, I gave myself to the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. So God gave him wisdom to know the things of God, and here he is going and using his wisdom to go after evil. And so he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That guy needed pure life ministries. He had a big problem because it says his love of strange women, and they weren't just weird. They were strange in the sense from other countries, worshiping other gods. His love of strange women took his heart away to go after other gods. And he built temples to idols in Jerusalem. 
the man became a very, very wicked king. Because of the promises that God had given David, he went and says, the judgment won't fall upon you, but it'll fall upon your son. So with his son Rehoboam, there was a bloodless civil war. The nation was split in two. So you had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Never in the history of the northern kingdom of Israel was there a righteous king. Every single king was an idolater, these wicked, evil men, and Ahab is given the testimony of being the worst of the worst that Israel ever had. More vile, more evil, taking it to a greater extent than any of the kings before him. And so Elijah's taking 12 stones, the 12 tribes of Israel, putting them there. And you know what that is? He's making a testimony. He says, you as a nation are in rebellion against God. Not just as a king, you as a nation is in rebellion. God created the people to be one people with one king. But what's the chance of Ahab giving up the throne so that the people could be united and God's blessing might fall upon them? And you know what this is really all about? And I'm only going to take a couple of minutes on this, but this is serious stuff. He was building those stones to restore covenant. Covenant is extremely important in the Bible. God is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God, and he demands that his people be covenant making and covenant keeping people. But we live in a culture that is a covenant breaking culture that thinks nothing about breaking covenant, thinks nothing about making another one and breaking that one. The biggest of which, the most sacred apart from ours with God is the, the covenant of marriage. Break the covenant of marriage all the time. It says nothing is thought of it anymore. That is more serious than people understand. God is more enraged at that than what people can imagine because they're not willing to go to the Word of God and see what the Word of God has to say. They want what they want, and they're going to do what they want, and they're going to somehow twist whatever they can in the Word of God to give them what they want. But God demands we become a covenant-making, covenant-keeping people, and when we break covenant, we will answer to God for it. Now, does that mean that God's not a God of grace? Absolutely, he's a God of grace, but we better understand he's a God of covenant. Those two aren't at war with each other, so he's going to demand of us how we have kept covenant. When we can break covenant with each other in all these host of ways, then we're at the very core of the problem, a covenant breaker with God. How many times have people made promises to God, made covenants to God, and never fulfilled them? And so how's God's blessing going to be upon us when we're covenant breakers rather than people that are faithful to our covenants. That's serious stuff. Restoring our covenant with God and it points us to Christ's sacrifice. New covenant, right? The new covenant. That's the New Testament, right? The new covenant. What is it making a covenant with God? Salvation, being born again, is entering into covenant with God. What does that mean? Being faithful to the covenant we make with God. And if we are not faithful to the covenant we make with God, then God will hold us accountable because we made a covenant with him. I mean, Christianity is serious stuff. It's just not a game, and we become so flippant over it. We are saved by grace. The only way that we're saved, but that doesn't mean there isn't accountability. There isn't something we need to live out. Now, let's go back to this statement where King Ahab went and says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Well, here's how Elijah responded. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. <laughs> I like this guy. He just says it like it is. He says, no, you're the one that's troubled Israel because you've not been faithful to God. But how much have you troubled your family? Because you've been unfaithful. You've been a covenant breaker. You've been a troubler of your family. You've caused your family nightmares because you've been unfaithful, because you haven't walked with God, because you gave over to the lust of the flesh and you keep going over to it because you have not made the choice to make a covenant with God and hold to that covenant no matter what it costs you. You've not come to the place to say, I would rather die than to break my covenant. I was saved out of a life of drugs. I was a hippie. I was radically saved, instantly delivered from drugs, alcohol, smoking. I'm just a newborn babe. I came out of Catholicism, and I wasn't even a good Catholic. I was a drug addict Catholic. That two weeks after I'm saved, my old best friend shows up at the door, and he comes in, and before I knew it, he had a joint lit, and I just wasn't strong enough. Just wasn't strong enough. I got high. I partied that whole day, 
And when I finally got home that night, I was so utterly, completely, totally miserable and devastated. I got on my face before God and I made a covenant. God, I will never smoke dope again. I will never drink again. I will never do drugs again. I vow to you. I would rather lose my head off my shoulders than to break that covenant with him. Forty-seven years later, that covenant has been faithfully lived. It's not a law to me, but it's an understanding that I made this vow to God, and I want to be faithful to my vow to him. The second thing we need to do. So first, Elijah went and prepared the altar, restored the covenant. The next thing he did is he prepared the sacrifice. He went and took the sacrifice, cut it up according to what was required. So as a prophet, he would have been taught those things. So he went and cut it up, put it on the altar, and he did everything according to what was required of him. You know, legalism is never holiness, and holiness is never legalism. When people go and they, they try and say, those who are trying to really walk with God, they say, ah, it's just legalism. They're just looking for an escape. That's all it is. I mean, it's, it's just a joke. If you don't have a passion for holiness, it's because you don't have a real relationship with Jesus. You need to look at, are you really born again? Are you really walking with Jesus? Or are you in some kind of lie and deception? The natural response of being in relationship with a holy God is that you want to be holy because you don't want to break his heart anymore. You don't want to sin against him. You want to bring joy to his heart. And so it becomes a joy to you to walk in holiness. And so we must prepare the sacrifice, not according to the church's standard, not according to our standard, not according to our opinions, but according to the word of God, according to his standard. And so the very first thing, and it must always begin, this is the foundation, this is where, where it has to begin, it must begin at the place of loving God supremely. That is the greatest commandment, love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if we will come to the place to begin to live at least the fullest extent that we can, that commandment, then everything else will start finding its rightful place. The reason why we have so many problems with all the other stuff in our life, because we are breaking the first and greatest commandment. That is covenant right there. The covenant, the new covenant is about loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The breaking of that covenant always begins with the forsaking of our first love. Always begins with that. And so if we're going to prepare the sacrifice, the sacrifice must be prepared in the heart, saying, God, help me to love you. Help me to love you with everything. Help me to deal with these idols in my heart that take me away. God, help me to deal with these things that I might learn how to love you supremely. The other aspect of this is to prepare the sacrifice is we must be abandoned to Christ. You see that, that bull that was slain and put on an altar? He was dead. It was done. No arguments, no saying, I don't want to be here. It was over. He died to be that sacrifice. And we're called in Romans 12 to be a living sacrifice. It's giving it all. It's not giving part of it. It's not giving what's convenient. It's not doing it how it, we want to. It's obedience. Abandon to Christ. I read some years ago about uh, the Vietnamese Assembly of God. And I'm ordained with the assemblies. The Assemblies of God in, in Vietnam, it's his own organization. But they have something a little different there. You've got to go through whatever educational things that they require and give evidence of salvation, but you cannot become an ordained minister unless you've been in prison. Unless you have spent time in jail because you have preached the gospel, because preaching the gospel is illegal in that country, and if you preach the gospel, you're going to end up in jail. If you haven't been in jail, it's because you haven't been preaching the gospel. And you know, when I read that, I'm going, dear God, would I be ordained with the assemblies of God if that was a criteria? How many ministers would be ordained? They were saying, they were demanding, if you're going to be one of our ministers, you live it. You live it to the fullest. You live it completely. You let it define your life. You let others see the reality that you love me supremely and you are committed to me above everything and anything else. You will lay down your life for me for what I'm calling you to do, what I'm calling you to be. That's not American Christianity, but that is biblical Christianity. We must develop a life of prayer so that we have authentic power. How are you going to die for Jesus if you won't pray? Come on, let's just be real here. Do you have a prayer life? Do you have any kind of prayer life at all? I mean, do you struggle for 15 minutes a day? Wow, man, what sacrifice. I'm being a little sarcastic there. 
I mean, think of that. Just, okay, uh, Jesus, you're just worth talking to you on the way to work. That's all you're worth to me. I will not take my time. I will not shut the TV off. I will not get off social media because you're not worth it. I will only talk to you on the way to work or I'll give you 15 minutes and maybe I'll read a verse or two. I, I bought that one minute devotional, God. Aren't you pleased with that one minute devotional here? Yes, isn't that great? Throw it in the trash. Really, I mean, that's not Christianity. It has nothing to do with the word of God because those who love Jesus want to be with Jesus. And they want to be with Jesus and they'll live like they want to be with Jesus. And it'll be where they're in the word, they're in the place of prayer, their, their life is defined by it. It's not something that happens by accident. We must have this passion for personal holiness if we are going to prepare the sacrifice. And it's only when these things are there that we start having free access to God like Elijah had. You see, Elijah had free access to God. He's in the place of fellowship with God. God says, go to Ahab and tell him it's not going to rain except at your word. Three and a half years later, he's in fellowship with God. And the Lord says, go tell Ahab it's going to rain now. Right, right there, this obedience, this place of obedience, this loving obedience, free access. It opens up the door to heaven because now we can begin to pray and see God do greater things because we're starting to walk in greater intimacy and fellowship with him. He's becoming the passion of our life and not an addition to our life. The third point is after the altar was built, the sacrifice was put on it. You know what this man did? He took all this water and poured it all over the sacrifice. What a crazy prophet. <laughs> I mean, this man's nuts. When you look at, at John the Baptist, okay, he came in the spirit of Elijah. That's the, why he was a wild man. You know, I'm cool. I like John the Baptist too. <laughs> Elijah soaked the altar with water, filled the trench, built a trench on, filled it up. It was flowing over. All of Israel, all the prophets of Baal, the king, and all of his entourage and soldiers that are there, they saw him pour all this water on it. There's no way he could be faking anything here now. What's going to happen had to be a God thing or it would not happen at all. But what's the water representative of in the New Testament? The Holy Spirit. Water in the New Testament is the Holy Spirit. And see, this is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I totally, completely, absolutely believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe it is available for every Christian. Any Christian that wants it, it's there. If you'll be willing to believe, seek, and have people pray for you, and you need a desperation that you seek it, no matter how much it takes until you get it, because you say, God, you promised it for me. It's a promise for me, and I want it no matter what. If you've got to be prayed for a hundred times, you'll be prayed for a hundred times, because you end up saying, God, this is a promise for me, and whatever you want me to have, I want. I think it's a very sad thing when people say, no, I don't need that. Well, I guess you're smarter than God then. He said you do, you say you don't, guess who's right? Why would we say no? Why would we not seek it? Why would we, why would we take something that God says we need and poo-poo it, just brush it off, just no big deal. I don't need that in my life. It's not, I've, I've done all right, have you? What could you be otherwise? But you know what this really speaks of? And, and people can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and miss this because the baptism of the Holy Ghost doesn't guarantee anything. It's just the gift given that we can become the people we should be. Okay, the potential is there. It's not the finish, it's the potential. But you know what this means is that he wants to become a people that are so dependent upon the Holy Spirit that we live and move in a realm of usefulness for God. That's what it's all about that he can begin to operate through us in a deeper way. Our communication with God, the Holy Spirit, becomes deeper that we might see God do greater things. So it's this passion, this desire, this yearning for nearness with him, and then we begin to love the communion with God. Love the communion. Love the fellowship. Do you know what it is to fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Do you know what it is to feel his presence? That's what he wants for our life in a deeper way, that we might walk in greater power, and that the world would know that we belong to Jesus. And so we need to be desperate about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and about the Spirit of God being poured out in our lives individually and about the Spirit of God being poured out in the church where our hearts are aching, God, that you would reveal yourself, that you reveal yourself. A divine magnetism beginning to flow through the church and start, just the lost start coming in, walking in. I was in meetings in Bullhead City, Arizona, the hottest city in the nation, and this guy comes into 
he was a backslider. He comes into the church, and he ends up responding, going to the altar, giving his life to Christ. And he says, I woke up this morning, and you know, I haven't been to church for so long, and I just felt I had to go to church. And so I hop in my car, and I start, I start driving. And all of a sudden, I'm going, no, I'm not to go there. And he didn't even know why. He turned around. He went the whole opposite direction, ended up going to this church. And so what does he do? He comes to Christ. He returns to Christ. Divine magnetism where the Holy Spirit can pull even upon the unsaved and draw them in because the church is so full of the Holy Ghost, so full of the power of God. And the only way the church can be full of the Holy Ghost is when the people that attend the church are full of the Holy Ghost. You understand the fuller we are, the fuller the church is, and the fuller the church is, the greater it flows through the church to a perishing world. You see, only when these three things were done did the fire of God fall. When it was all done right, when it was all done right, when the covenant was made, restored, when the sacrifice was ready and pleasing, when the Holy Spirit, the water, had filled the whole trough and the whole altar, then it was ready, and then the fire fell. John the Baptist prophesying about Christ and what his ministry would be, he says, I baptize you in water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's no time date on that. This is the heart of God. This is a man that was before the church. He was the last Old Testament prophet. He's this transitional figure from the Old Testament to the New. He doesn't really fit neither of them, but yet here he is prophesying about the New Testament church, and this is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. When did that come? It came after his death, after his resurrection, and after his ascension when he was glorified. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more Come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing waters